<laughs> well, well, welcome everybody to uh, the March meeting of the Moines Peninsula Astronomical Society. And that noise that you're hearing is the noise of the uh, laser firing on Mars. So the Perseverance uh, rover is uh, firing uh, 30 shots of a laser, you can hear all 30 in the background. And uh, on the front slide here, I'll show a picture of uh, Person here firing its uh, green laser to try and uh, vaporise the rock, which you can see in doing. And, uh, and then down the bottom there, of course, is from H.G. Uh, Wells' uh, War of the Worlds, <laughs> of uh, one of the Martians firing on uh, the H&S uh, Thunderchild and, uh, and sinking it. So uh, we're, we're, we're having our own back on Mars by, uh, by firing <laughs> lasers at them uh, instead. So that's the actual sound that we've uh, transmitted back. Now, what uh, I'll also do, is I showed this uh, at last month's meeting, but since many of you weren't here at last month and you might not have uh, had a chance to look at it online, I'll, um, uh, I'll actually show what we showed at the last meeting because it was the day before the Perseverance uh, rover landed on us. Uh, just so you get uh, an idea of it, because Trevor's talk a little bit later is going to be on Mars, and um, he doesn't actually go into the details here, so he makes uh, an assumption that you've already seen it. Now, it's probably going to be a bit loud, so I'm going to have to um, crank it down at the, at the right point. So the actual uh, video of that coming down uh, had no audio to it at all, so it was just a uh, scientific visualisation, so uh, I added a background to that to make it a little bit more dramatic coming in. Um, but uh, the sequence of it coming in that you saw in that simulation, um, uh, we'll, we'll uh, go through on, uh, on Trevor's talk a little bit later. 
So, this uh, picture in the background, do not adjust your seats or move your head around, otherwise you'll get dizzy, is uh, a 360 degree panorama of what uh, Perseverance uh, saw, I believe, on the 22nd of February, which was, uh, um, I think, uh, this wasn't available at the time when Trevor put together, uh, put together his tour. Um, if there are any new members here tonight, uh, I think there was one at least, um, yeah, a couple of you, fantastic. Well, welcome to the Society. And uh, this, uh, so this, this panorama was, uh, was taken by um, uh, Perseverance and Stitch together. And you can tell the stitching, if you look at the skyline up there, you'll see every now and again the vertical darker areas where um, the individual images are being uh, stitched together. So as uh, usual, I'll go uh, through some of the events that uh, have occurred in the past month since we were last here. And also look at the uh, events uh, coming up. Um, in, uh, in the next month and, uh, and before. Then we'll go on to uh, Trevor's talk uh, on Destination Mars. Now, he actually gave this talk at the last uh, public night, but because um, it was so full, members weren't able to actually uh, sit in on it. So normally members uh, are able to uh, sit in for free uh, at any of the public nights, but during COVID restrictions, this is all the number of seats that uh, that we can have, uh, unfortunately, so it makes it a bit more difficult. So what we'll do is we'll Back put, put those sort of um, videos actually um, in, uh, in this meeting as well, so that uh, the members don't miss out at all. Uh, then after um, the talk on Destination Mars, there'll be uh, Sky for the Month by uh, Mark Stevens, who's uh, sitting in the back. Then we'll have a, a bit of a tea break, and during the tea break, uh, there'll be two things. One, uh, I imagine the observatory will be open for uh, looking at the night sky, if you wish, or just uh, catching up socially with people. Uh, and uh, in parallel with that in here, I'll, I'll put on uh, several uh, science videos uh, shown down there as well. Now, the noise you hear in the background is from the microphone on the Perseverance rover. So it's the first time audio has been recorded on Mars. And you can, you can hear it, if I, if I go quiet, it's like a very gentle breeze blowing in the background over a microphone. And in fact, uh, Trevor talks about this uh, during his talk, the, uh, the, the breeze uh, that's there. Uh, particularly if any of you have seen the Matt Damon uh, movie, The Martian, uh, where uh, there's a bit of a storm shown on Mars, uh, he'll make a comment about that as well. Uh, now, for the science videos afterwards, we'll look at the history of Pi, because um, I see on the internet, at least for the Americans, they refer to it as Pi Day because um, a few days ago was um, the 14th of March, and of course they write their dates in the format uh, 314, which of course are the first three digits of pi, the same as um, their 11th of September, they refer to as 9-11, right? So exactly the same way. So I'll give a bit of a video on, on the number pi and how it is actually being worked out in history. Uh, then we'll explain why, why, uh, why itching is contagious and I challenge any of you to actually sit in here and not scratch yourself as you're watching this if uh, you decide to come in and watch the videos after the tea break. Um, then we'll uh, look at something important like uh, how, do they, how do astronauts actually um, uh, care for their hair and uh, fingernails in, in space and um, that, uh, that interesting one from the International Space Station is given by uh, Captain Samantha Cristoforetti, uh, an Italian astronaut as part of uh, the European Space Agency. And lastly, uh, some of the basics on uh, what the electromagnetic uh, spectrum is. And um, that particular um, uh, video, uh, educational video, is given by um, uh, the, uh, the organisation in America that um, is charged with uh, their space defence. So it's the uh, new one, I think, that was set up under, uh, under Trump uh, originally. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave you to see how interesting that video actually is. Then at the end, we'll uh, close with uh, a very interesting uh, video of um, all the phases and librations of the moon for the entire 2021, all in a, a couple of minutes, uh, with a bit of a Vivaldi uh, background to it as well. So last look at uh, Mars. Hey, no, I noticed there's a McDonald's sign up there. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. well, I've been watching. Sorry? No, well, I've been watching. <laughs> now, obviously, Mars has already been conquered. Okay, that's a bit quieter now. Uh, right, so after our last meeting, we had the Telescope Learning Day up here, which uh, was uh, all of a uh, Saturday, and uh, there were about 45 uh, people turned up there. Unfortunately, uh, it was effectively clouded out uh, for the evening, which uh, is uh, 
tends to be inevitable whenever you get the telescopes out, it, it uh, usually ends up very, very cloudy. But nevertheless, uh, a, a good time of um, uh, talks uh, in here and uh, explaining uh, telescopes uh, occurred during the evening. Uh, and this was actually at the same time as a very large music concert was going on just over the hill at, at the Brides with about 8,000 attendants, I think. So a very unusual day uh, for all concerned. Then a few days later, a uh, committee met and uh, amongst uh, the highlights of uh, what was met uh, there was um, we're um, having another work experience student this year and she'll start here at uh, the, uh, the Briars in June. Um, uh, the uh, grant applications, we've been successful in uh, uh, getting a grant for a meteorite, uh, which we will um, uh, dutifully uh, work on between now and uh, Science Week. And uh, we are also uh, discussing about uh, the public night uh, for the lunar eclipse coming up, um, I think that's May from memory, I didn't look up the other day, which will be held at uh, Frankston uh, Foreshore, so uh, a little bit uh, further north than what we uh, normally have. Then on the 2nd March we visited uh, Camp Aluka, as it used to be called when the Girl Guides owned it, and these days it's called Aluka Retreat in Shoreham. Uh, Shoreham. And uh, the picture down the bottom by uh, Merida there uh, shows uh, the setup while it was still light. Uh, set up on a hill and uh, they have a, a thing called a pipe hinge actually on the top of the hill which is to the right there, but uh, you can't sort of see it in that resolution of an image. And there are only two pipe hinges actually in all of Victoria. And the other one is up at the uh, Ballarat Observatory, up at uh, Ballarat. And uh, they were um, uh, installed at the time of a very large jamboree uh, that was, um, oh gosh, decades ago, maybe three, three or four decades ago. Um, we had 75 uh, Year 5 students at, uh, that night and uh, all had a very, uh, very good uh, time. <laughs> In 5th of March we had the public stargazing night where Trevor talked about Mars and that is uh, the talk you'll hear uh, in a moment because Trevor's not able to uh, get here on a Wednesday but uh, fortunately he recorded um, the, uh, the meeting so that uh, you can uh, see it. Uh, the public night was completely clouded out uh, effectively uh, which means that the next public night coming up, the April public night, um, there's probably going to be a few people coming in halfway uh, because we usually allow people to come back at uh, the next public night for free uh, if it's clouded out so that they can at least join in uh, for the telescopes and get a second, uh, second uh, try at seeing the night sky. So coming up soon, tomorrow night we've got um, a, a girls school down at uh, Merrick's and um, that one uh, actually has enough telescopes at the moment for the, uh, the number of uh, students we have there, it's only uh, about 33. We've done that uh, uh, school uh, before and they've been very, very impressed uh, with uh, what they've seen from us as well. So they've, uh, they've eagerly asked us back. Uh, we've got a members barbecue this coming Saturday. So it's always the Saturday after this uh, monthly meeting that we hold, uh, that will be here at the Bryce, usually somewhere between five and 6 p.m. The barbecue is uh, five up. And uh, we'll also have at that barbecue uh, a geologist, and this is uh, the geologist Mike Cleland who is going to be guiding us around uh, Point Leo on the Sunday for those who booked in to the uh, field trip, all being, all being well. We're still waiting for final approval from um, the uh, Point Leo Authority. So that's the authority that looks after the Point Leo region. And um, it's not state government, it's not uh, local council, it's something else. And uh, we're hoping to get that to tomorrow, fingers Fingers crossed, all being well. Um, next committee meeting will probably be on Zoom. Um, that was on the 24th of March. Any member is welcome to dial in and listen to that uh, if they wish. And we usually send out the details on the um, East Scorpius email group beforehand. Uh, next public uh, stargazing night is already booked out to our COVID capacity, which is uh, as many as you sort of see here in uh, the room tonight. And the next meeting coming up um, is uh, fairly late in April, so the 21st of April. Then looking a bit further afield in May, uh, we have uh, a number of um, uh, school nights uh, coming up that have come onto the calendar recently. And one of them is fairly large, the Parkdale one um, is quite large at 170. Although it's called Parkdale Secondary College, it's really actually in uh, Morty Alec, but um, I suppose at one stage maybe they were um, in the boundary of uh, Parkdale. Uh, and lastly, um, in uh, National Science Week in August, uh, we'll be putting together a talk all on uh, meteorites and shooting stars to actually go with the meteorite that we'll get from the grant. Um, all being well with actually acquiring it overseas during uh, COVID lockdown, of course.
So tonight's uh, talk is given by Trevor. Those of you who've been in the society a while will recognise uh, his uh, face there. And um, uh, he's going to be talking about uh, Destination Mars. He's given uh, many astronomy talks on cruise ships around the world. Uh, so he's eagerly sought after to, uh, to go on cruises to speak to the uh, captive audiences who can't uh, run away on a cruise ship. And uh, so he, he gets uh, many hundreds at a time. Um, and of course, uh, it's an interesting environment on a cruise ship if uh, it's moving around and you're trying to talk. If you're standing on the stage and that stage keeps moving on you, it's very, very challenging. So what I'll do now is I'll kick off uh, the talk and hopefully I'll get the, uh, the volume right because um, uh, I don't think his microphone um, was uh, terribly uh, sensitive, but it should be uh, enough uh, to hear. And after Trevor's talk, uh, Trevor's talk will go for about three quarters of an hour or so, so maybe until about nine o'clock or, or thereabouts on the clock at the front there. Uh, and then after that, we'll go into uh, Sky for the month uh, by uh, Mark, and then uh, into uh, the tea break. So, as I said, my talk tonight is called Destination Mars. So I'll start off a little bit with the comparison between Mars and the Earth, how they um, compare in size, and, and just a very brief overview of some of the previous missions to Mars, just to give you an idea I've skipped most of them, so there's just a very small smattering of, of different um, missions. Give you an idea of some of the background of the, um, of the Perseverance landing, which was only a couple of weeks ago. And uh, a little bit about what's happening after the current rover that just landed. What are they going to do after that as well? So in a size comparison, the Earth and Mars Mars is around about half the diameter of the Earth. It takes around about two years to go around the Sun. So, because it's much, much further away, so every time we go around once, it's only gone around half a time. So we go around twice for every Martian year. And I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later because that has an implication of when we can actually send missions to Mars. We can't just send them at any time. <coughs> and it's interesting that one day on Mars is almost one Earth day. The term for today on Mars is a soul. So if you hear something, particularly first of year, says to, you know, soul two, soul five, whatever, that's the Martian day that it's been on there. Now it's interesting, the people that drive those rovers around in NASA, they actually have a Martian clock. That is a clock that takes 24.6 hours, so that they know basically is it daylight where the rover is or is it night time. And so as they go through their mission, they might initially start working through the day, but then later, as that 0.6 hours builds up, they're doing their work in the middle of the night, so they might be going to work at 2 a.m. to drive the rover where it's the middle of the day on Mars. And so they have to have this clock so they can look up and they can see, oh, it's midday on Mars, and if you look out the window, it's pitch black. So they have to get used to this Martian <coughs> day. Unlike our Earth, it has two moons, but very, very small. They're nothing more than really just captured asteroids. Now, when they first looked at Mars through a telescope, they noticed that it seemed to have seasons. They would look at it one part of its Martian year and it would look relatively clear. And then half a rotation, six months, if you like, six Martian months later, it would often change in the whole image of the surface would completely change depending upon whether it's summer or winter on Mars. Then initially, because they knew no different, you're talking back in the 1800s, they thought that that change that was very, very obvious to a telescope could be perhaps there's some sort of vegetation on Mars that in the warmer weather, it starts to grow and it changes the appearance of the surface. And that that's why it was changing through the telescope. So they thought there's some sort of life, very simple, but just vegetation like some sort of grasses or moss or something like that. 
but we now know that these are actually dust storms. So this is a picture of a dust storm just starting to roll in over the surface of Mars. Now it's interesting, on Mars, the, um, the temperature varies more so to do with the distance from the sun compared to us. Our seasons are almost nothing to do with the distance. It just happens that our winter in the southern hemisphere is very close to when the Earth is furthest from the sun. But that really has almost no measurable effect on our temperature. Because in the northern hemisphere, we're also furthest from the sun, but it's the summer in the northern hemisphere. It's to do with our tilt. On Mars, you'll see later on another diagram that the distance between the sun and Mars varies quite considerably. So when Mars is at its closest to the sun, Mars is actually quite a bit warmer than when it's furthest away. The tilt has something to do with it, but a lot of the changes are purely the distance between the Sun and Mars instead of uh, with our Earth. Now these winds can be up to kilometre, 80 kilometres <laughs> per hour, which you would think 80 kilometres an hour, that is quite a strong breeze. But the, the pressure of the atmosphere on Mars is only 0.6 of a percent of what it is on the Earth. So the wind is blowing incredibly fast, but if you had an 80 kilometre an hour breeze on Mars blow through your window, it would barely blow a piece of paper off the desk because of such a low pressure. Anyone that's seen the movie The Martian, where they had to evacuate because of this storm, the biggest storm wouldn't, if I put a piece of paper here, it would probably flutter. So a little bit of artistic license there on that move because the atmospheric pressure is so low. So you can see here the difference when the Earth is the furthest from the Sun, it's 152 million kilometres versus 147 when it's the closest. It only varies by about 3%, not a huge difference. On Mars though, the distance varies by 17%, so it's a much, much bigger difference. So you can see that when it's at its longest distance from the sun, it's significantly further than when it's at the perihelion, which is the closest. And you'll see on um, the orbit of the Earth, ours are actually opposite. When we're furthest, it's actually closest, and when it's closest, we're furthest. But in our case, the distance between the Earth and the sun closest to furthest doesn't change sufficiently to actually alter the temperature on the Earth. As I said, it's the tilt that gives us the seasons, not the distance. It just happens, as I said, in the southern hemisphere, in our winter, we're furthest, and in our summer, we're closest. But in the northern hemisphere, it's also the closest, but it's the winter. Now, these dust storms, because they've observed Mars for quite a while, roughly one in three Martian years, the whole planet becomes enshrouded in a dust storm. So you can see the difference to what the surface of Mars looks like when it's completely covered in a dust storm versus when it's clear, when there, there is no dust storm. It doesn't happen every year, but it does happen one in three. The other thing they noticed, it has polar ice caps like ours, and you can see those through a telescope. Um, Mars is sort of way over there now, so it's quite a long way away. But a few months ago, it was quite close. And through a telescope, you would have seen the white polar caps on the top and the bottom. Except unlike the Earth, where they're ice, these are frozen, largely frozen carbon dioxide, so dry ice. And with the seasons, the size of these caps change so that the southern polar cap appears to get larger during the Martian winter when it's furthest away from the sun. Here's a couple of, or three, shots taken of the same area separated by essentially six months or so, Martian months, half a Martian year. And you can see the difference in the size of the polar cap. So when they launched the first 
probes past Mars, and the first one only went past. They didn't have the technology to go into orbit, so as it went past, it took as many photos as it could as it approached and then left. They were hoping that they might see some sort of maybe a red surface with trees or something like that growing on it, which would explain this change in appearance because they didn't know it was a dust storm back then. We were talking the 1960s. And when they went past, they noticed it's covered in craters. Now, the image quality is not that great. This is the best picture they got. You can see it's actually quite crude, but it's obvious that the surface was covered in craters. The whole hopes that the planet would be covered in these magical forests, albeit quite simple sort of organisms or something, simple plants, was all dashed when they realised it didn't look much different to the moon except it was red, covered in craters. And in fact, it's got about 43,000 craters that are more than five kilometres across. So that's, that's a pretty big hole. And there's tens of thousands of them all across the surface. Now when Mariner, um, when Mariner 9 went into orbit around Mars, it, had, it actually arrived when there was a massive planet-wide storm, dust storm. So they couldn't see anything, but because it was in orbit, they could wait until the dust finally settled. And they knew it would eventually settle. So they waited, and after a while, the dust started to settle, and three features appeared. The rest of the planet was enshrouded in dust, and three features appeared above this dust as it began to settle. And they realised that these were volcanoes. These were the top of massive volcanoes, similar to the volcanoes on Earth, but much, much bigger. When it settled down and they could get a good view, this is an artist's conception of what um, it looks like, but it was the largest volcano in the whole solar system. There is nothing this big on any other planet or any other moon. Much, much bigger than anything on the Earth. Olympus Mons. This is a view of the top. And you can see it's got this massive caldera, which would have been the top of the volcano. And it's been hit with a few meteorites as well. It's about 21 kilometres high. Because the gravity on Mars is much, much less than on the Earth, Mountains on the Earth can only get to about 10 kilometres, 10,000 metres, which happens to be the highest Mount Everest on the Earth. When you pile granite up that high, it becomes so heavy that it can't support much more height. And so as you make the mountain try to get much higher, it collapses further, so you can't get any higher. On Mars, because the gravity is much, much less, it can actually build the mountains much higher because the mass, the weight that it has support, is much lower. And so that's why some of the mountains on Mars are much, much higher than they are on Earth, because the gravity allows that. In comparison to the mountains that are here on Earth, it's three times higher than Mount Everest. So if we had Mount Everest here, Olympus Mons would tower way above Mount Everest, and Mauna Kea, which is actually the highest mountain in the world, but it starts at, it's below sea level. So Everest sticks up higher in the atmosphere, but Mauna Kea starts so far below the ocean that if you were to go from where Mauna Kea actually starts to the peak, it's actually quite a bit higher than, um, than Mount Everest. The caldera at the top is actually 85 kilometres by 60. It's about three kilometres deep. You could fit the whole of Phillip Island six times. Six Phillip Islands in the whole thing. That's a lot of penguins. Right? <laughs> the other feature that, that um, Mariner found is Valus Marinaris. That was named after, they named these features after the discoverer, even if the discoverer isn't a person. 
So Mariner discovered it, so it's named after the probe, Valdis Marinaris. It's about 4,000 kilometres long, so it stretches about a quarter of the planet, 200 kilometres at its widest and 7 kilometres deep. It makes the Grand Canyon look like a, a little tributary off to the side, dwarfs it in size. If you could take the Valdis Marinaris and move it to the surface of the Earth, it would stretch from one side of America to the other, or from Perth to Sydney. America and, and Australia are roughly the same size, but no one's actually done one like this with Australia. I should probably do something like this myself. But um, it's basically the same width as the whole of America or the whole of Australia, one single canyon. So if we look at the comparison, the Grand Canyon is 450 kilometres long, this is 4,000. 200 kilometres wide versus 29, 7 kilometres deep versus 1.8. So in all scales, it's considerably bigger, right? The largest canyon also in the solar system. When they take close-up views at the ends of various parts, they can see what appears to be obvious evidence that water at some time has flowed through here. And you can see there's lots of boulders which are now covered in dust, but at some time they appear to have been washed down by huge torrents coming down the canyon and depositing them here. It's the same sort of thing as what you see at the end of what they call a glacial moraine, where a glacier pushes boulders down and then the glacier melts and it leaves all these boulders. It's the same sort of thing, but on Mars it seemed to have been caused by a massive flow of water. Now in 1976, they had their first lander that actually landed in one area of Viking, one landed in an area called Chrysi Planitia, and you can see it's just rocks, as far as the eye can see. Unfortunately, this one was quite simple and it, it didn't have any wheels or anything, so it stayed there. It's still there. It's probably covered in dust, but it's just stayed there. All it could do, it had a little robot, robotic arm that it could reach out and grab samples. And Viking 2 landed in another area. You'll see this frost. This was taken early in the morning. This is frozen carbon dioxide, not water ice. So this is dry ice because it gets so cold. 2003, Spirit and Opportunity, which is probably the one that most people of these days are a little bit more aware of. Viking sort of predates uh, the, the general awareness. Not many people can remember things. I can remember things that happened in the 1970s. I can remember the moon landing. Right, so 2003, Spirit and Opportunity landed. Now these are the most successful ever Hopefully, perseverance and curiosity will actually go on to break the records. But initially, they were designed to last 90 Martian days. Now, Spirit lasted in 2011, an opportunity to 2019, which is considerably more than three months. Many, many years. At the moment now, uh, one of them is totally dead, and the other one, uh, well, this one got bogged, and is now dead, and this one, um, it, it suffered some sort of a, a problem that it couldn't move and, it, and the panels were covered in dust and it couldn't recharge, and over the winter, the batteries just basically died. Like if you leave a battery out when it's really cold, you can't charge it up again because the, the battery just can't recover. And the temperature can get way, way, way below zero, and it would have been like that for months on end. So these two rovers are essentially now totally dead. But Opportunity covered about 40 kilometres. So that's about from Frankston to Melbourne. So it was able to cover that distance, which isn't bad if you consider top speed, it goes about this fast. <laughs> now that's a long way. If you want to go to Frankston, you don't start at this sort of speed. <laughs> Right? It takes you years, and it did, it took them years. But it covered nearly 40 kilometres, and this is one of the pictures that it returned. You can see this is an impact crater, a lot of dust on the bottom, 
and you can see lots of broken rock and that from the impact. In 2005, NASA released photos that confirmed that at some time there was flowing water on the surface. You can see here, this is taken from above, you can see the definite sedimentary layers of material laid one on top of the other on the surface. You can see in one of these pictures, you can see the lines of the sedimentary layers of rock. The, um, these bits that are running down is just where a rock has moved or something and the dirt, the loose dust has just run down the side. But you can see the sedimentary features. Here on impact craters, you can see there's been an impact and what appears to be water sloshing out. So as a meteorite has impacted, the heat has melted the ice that was in the surface and the water ice or the ice has, has thawed from the heat from the impact, flowed out and then either evaporated or freezed solid again and you can see the line of where that water splashed out from that, the heat from that impact. So we know now that the surface of Mars at one time was actually covered by a massive ocean. If we were to look at Mars, say through a telescope or with an orbiting probe several billion years ago, it would have looked more like this. But what they've done to create this, because they've got the topography, the altitude of all of the areas on Mars, so they distribute the amount of water they know there's now as if it was a lake, and this is what it would have looked like. So this ocean would have left a few little islands here and there. It would have covered the whole planet to a depth of about six metres. So this whole building would be underwater. And it contains about five cubic kilometres of ice. Almost as much ice is what is on Greenland. And Greenland is largely a very, very thick layer of ice sitting on top of uh, the rocks underneath. 2011, Curiosity was launched. This was much more, um, much more sophisticated mission, and Perseverance, which just landed, is based on the design of Curiosity. So you'll see that the two of them look very similar if you've seen some pictures of Perseverance. So very, very close to what uh, Curiosity looks like. The target area was a. Um, you can see it's a crater, and there's a bit of a mountain in the middle. And it landed somewhere in this circle and the idea was to drive around and investigate around various parts on this impact crater during its mission. You can see the size compared to adults. It's roughly the size of maybe a mini minor, so it's actually quite large. And you can see some of the earlier ones. This is Spirit Opportunity and this is the Sojourner which actually preceded that, but it's about the size of an esky. That only covered about 20 metres. If I sort of removed that one, it was the first mobile one. Now the top speed is 30 metres per hour. So at that speed, if you're here, it'll take you half an hour to get to that door. That's the sort of speed that this travels at. So if it was an emergency, it would take you 30 minutes to get out of the door without stopping. This is some of the equipment that it carries on board. Right? So it has the ability to climb objects that are 75 centimetres, so three quarters of a metre high. So it can climb things about this high if necessary. It has several uh, cameras. The um, Perseverance has a lot of the similar equipment to this, but much, much more upgraded and a lot more other equipment, had a lot more cameras on board than what this one has. <coughs> this is one of the pictures, as you can see, this is <coughs> definitely sedimentary rock. You can see the definite layers of the rock built up one on top of the other. If you were sitting inside Curiosity at the moment in the driver's seat, looking out the, the front windscreen, this is what you would see. This is what Curiosity is looking at right now, out its front window, if you like. And its mission is to continue to drive up around this area, exploring. Now, as I said, the distance between um, 
Mars and the Sun varies with each orbit and because we go a lot faster we lap it <coughs> so you can't just send a mission to Mars when Mars is on the other side of the Sun you have to do it when the two planets are coming in close so that you'll see as this one as this leaves the Earth slowly gets further and further apart but it's heading for a target that's way over here and it was launched back here. So they, they don't just fire it to where Mars was. When they started the mission, they had to calculate where Mars is going to be by the time it traverses this distance. Now, because we're on the inside track, if you like, and we're going much, much faster, we only get one opportunity about every two years that we're coming up on the inside track as Mars is going around on the outside track and if we launch a mission in one of these, what they call a launch window, then we will get to Mars in the most efficient time. If you fire at the wrong time, you've got to traverse possibly half the solar system to get there. So when they have a launch window, that's when you will find lots of missions will be, will be sent off to Mars once every, 24, uh, every 26 weeks. The last launch window was July 2020. Any missions that were launched for Mars in 2020 were launched around about July and they would all arrive at Mars around about the same time because they used the same launch window. They also arrived within days or just a few weeks of one another. So the UAE Space Agency actually launched the Hope Orbiter, so that's just an orbiting mission. China also launched an orbiter and a rover and NASA launched the Perseverance and the Ingenuity drone so it's also carrying a helicopter if you like which hasn't taken off yet later in March I think it's about a couple of weeks the, uh, the drone will actually be launched to be the first flight on another body other than the Earth so anything that was launched in July 2020 would arrive around February 2021, which was just a couple of weeks ago. So the UAE Hope Orbiter, this is the, uh, the mission they launched. You can see it uses solar panels, has a huge antenna for uh, sending information back to the Earth or re receiving commands. It has a two-year mission and it went into orbit on the 9th of February. Essentially, because of its orbit, it will be Mars' first weather satellite. So it will be able to continuously monitor the weather on the whole planet. The dust storms, any clouds, temperatures, all this sort of thing. So it'll be the first one that will be able to monitor Mars's weather on a daily basis. China launched the Tianwen-1 orbiter, TW-1, on a two-year mission that uh, came into orbit on the 10th of February, again, just a few weeks ago. Now it has an orbiter that has two cameras. One has a resolution of 100 metres, so one pixel is 100 metres. So if it took a picture of here, this whole shed would be one pixel in size. The other one has a two metre resolution, so if it was to take a photo here, it would be able to see that we have an observatory out here and another shed here and it would see this shed's quite big and it would see that there are cars parked if that was what was on the surface of Mars. So that's the sort of resolution they can see. Down to two metres. So they could see an adult lying on the ground, that sort of size. It also has a rover, but it hasn't been launched yet. It's expected that they will launch it in May to land at some time. And then its, its mission is to rove around the surface of Mars, similar to what Perseverance is doing, and also collect samples with the expectation that sometime in the future they'll have another mission that will go to Mars and pick these samples up and bring them back. So it has a couple of major things that it's doing. It's, as you can see, it's very similar to Spirit and Opportunity, and I think it's more or less the same size. So you're talking about something that's probably about this big. So not huge, but certainly not small. 
the Perseverance rover, very similar to the, um, the one that's already up there, Curiosity, much, much the same size, but it has a lot more equipment on it. This is the sequence of the landing now. Has anyone seen the video of the, the Perseverance landing? Yeah. yeah. But I'll, I've got a clip, shortened down version. I watched it as it was actually landing and you sort of, you get goosebumps as it's coming down and go, yeah, it's landed and all this stuff. Right, so as it enters the atmosphere, it's going at about 20,000 kilometres per hour. That's 20 times faster than the speed of sound, 20 times faster than a bullet. So it has a heat shield on the bottom and it just essentially uses friction against the atmosphere to slow it down until it travels at about Mach 2 or about 2,000 kilometres an hour. So it's only going twice as fast as a bullet. Then it releases a parachute. Because the atmosphere on Mars is so thin, you need a massive parachute to slow you down because you need a lot of air underneath it and there's not very much air there. So to give you an idea of size, this is a standard door. You can see the little window in the top. So that's a standard size door like you would have at your house. And you can see how massive this parachute is. This is one of the test facilities. There's a massive fan here that blows air to check that it inflates properly. Now what they did with this mission, Perseverance and Curiosity, the previous ones, essentially, they put them inside this massive beach ball and it went bounce, 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 and then they deflated the thing and it was landed. They can't do that with this because it's so massive. It weighs about a tonne. You would need a massive beach ball. So what they do is they do a staged landing. So as it comes in, the heat shield drops away and it has what is essentially like a rocket pack with the crane on the bottom. So as it comes down, it starts to slow down. It's now released the parachute. The rocket engines turn on. That slows it down until it's almost just hovering. Then the crane lowers the Perseverance rover down on the end of this cable onto the surface. This is an actual picture. So this is taken from that crane from the surface. Looking down, here's the cables. Perseverance is suspended below, so the, the rockets are holding it in the atmosphere as it lowers Perseverance down to the surface. Then when it lands on the surface, it disconnects these cables. These rockets fire and it blasts off away, out of the way. Because the one thing you wouldn't want is to land and then have that drop on top of it. So it just fires itself away and I don't know how far away it is, but maybe a kilometre or more, and then it just runs out of fuel and it crashes. Right? It's done its job. And then the Perseverance rover has then landed on the surface. So this is a, if you, if you go to the website, uh, NASA website, oh, there's lots of others you can look at this. This is a shortened version. It actually goes for about five or six minutes, so I've cut it down quite a bit. I think the sound should play through the speaker. Applicate in the cage, shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 430 meters. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about Ten kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. No filter converge. Velocity solution three point three meters per second. Altitude seven point four kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about hundred meters per second. Six point six kilometers above the surface. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Now it's going to drop it. Right, so there it is. Sky crane maneuver has started. 
and this picture is looking down on about 20 meters off the surface from the bottom here looking at the surface so the rockets here are kicking up the dust everywhere and then when this we're getting signals from the ground, MRO this will be Tango nice. Delta Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. Next one. Right. Right. Everyone went nuts because during that whole time when it's landing, there's nothing they can do. Absolutely nothing. It's up to the computer on board the lander to make all of the decisions. If it makes a wrong decision, it crashes. There's nothing they can do about it. Absolutely. Now, the um, people have put up questions as to what on the parachute you would have noticed. It's got red and white sections. Why did they do that? Initially, I thought it was so they could determine that the parachute is deployed properly, but in actual fact, there's a secret message on it. They got a guy to put a message in there of dare mighty things. So it's a very simple code, right? So like um, D is the fourth letter of the alphabet. So you come from here, it's in binary, so the first one, that's a one, that's a two, that's a four. Four is the fourth letter of the alphabet. Um, if you go to H, one, two, four, eight. H is the eighth letter of the alphabet. So it's simple binary and the same with the numbers. Um, you find a simple number like 10, one, two, four, eight. Eight and two is 10. So what it actually encodes is their mighty things around the outside in the red. And these numbers are the GPS coordinates of the JPL headquarters. So they had to make the parachute anyway, so they got someone on. Can you put some sort of a secret message in there? And so he coded this stuff in the parachute. Apparently it didn't take long before people realised what it was, because it's a pretty simple thing, but I just thought, oh, look at that got little red and white bits so they know if it's turning or something, but it actually means something. Now because the distance between Mars and the Earth varies depending upon if we're on the same side as Mars or if we were on the opposite side, we're much, much further away. So when we're at our closest, it takes five minutes for the transmission. And on opposite sides, transmission takes 22 minutes. When it actually landed, there was a, a delay of a little bit over 11 minutes. So when they got the signal that it had landed, that was 11 minutes ago. So by the time it's, even before they realise it's entered the atmosphere, it's already on the ground, it's already taken pictures, it's already sent pictures back, and all they know is it's about to enter the atmosphere. But by that time, there could be a pile of rubbish sitting on the surface of the planet, and they won't know for another 11 minutes until they go, oh dear. We forgot to um, turn the on switch on or something like that. Because it takes so long for, even at the speed of light, it takes 11 minutes from where Mars was. That was probably maybe somewhere, or actually back here, somewhere here in its orbit to send that information back. So all of the instructions for the lander, and in particular the rover, must be planned ahead. So they can't sit there in their little thing with a steering wheel and drive the rover around the surface of Mars and go, oh, we'll just go around this rock. That's why it goes so slow, because there can be up to 22 minutes delay if you tell it to turn left. 22 minutes later, it will turn left. So could you imagine driving a car? You want to turn a corner? Okay. In 22 minutes, right, I'm on the Frankston freeway. In 22 minutes, so... In about a quarter of an hour, I need to take the exit ramp. Right, turn left. And then, 11 minutes later, you take the exit ramp. So they have to pre-plan everything, every single move, because if they make a mistake, and they say, go to some place, and it drives straight into a rock, it has, it has a, a lot of intelligence not to do that, but they still have to be very careful not to do the wrong thing, because the response time takes so long. 
Now this is the first colour image. This was from one of the uh, cameras on the front which is actually used for navigation and obstacle avoidance. So it's not one that will take normal photos which is why it's got a lot of curvature in it because it does, it's not a, a quality camera if you like. It's only for navigation. So it's only to check what's in front, where there are rocks and all this stuff. But it was the first camera that they turned on. They sent a black and white one and then they sent this colour one so you can see it's, um, it's brown and there's lots of rocks and that's about all you can see. There's a bit of a mountain in the distance which I think is the area that they're heading for ultimately when they start moving. Now they wanted to land in this area called Jezero Crater. In particular this area here because this looks like a river and like on Earth, it looks like a river delta where the river is emptied out. So because one of the major missions is to look for evidence of past life, they want to look for this evidence somewhere where it looks like there was a lot of free flowing water. And the best place is somewhere that looked like it was the termination of a river. So they've actually landed around here somewhere you say, why this one in particular? This is what they believe this looked like about three and a half billion years ago when Mars was covered in a massive ocean. They believe there was a river that wandered down into this crater and that this river opened out. So that delta would have been somewhere here in what is now a dried out lake that was inside, well, sorry, this side. This side here, this is a little bend in that river as it came in. And this is that delta where they wanted to look because this is where the river would have emptied out into. So this picture sort of <coughs> around that way. Where they actually landed is around about here. They're about two kilometres from their target area, which is this. This is the, um, those hills that you could just see on the, in the horizon in the distance. So that's what they want to head towards because that's where they think they might find evidence of past life, fossils of some sort, because it's an outflow of a river. This is a close-up taken from one of the orbiters. You can see here, here's the rover sitting there. This is um, where the dust has been blown away from those rockets as it's come in to land. And at the moment it's just sitting there, the rover hasn't actually started to move yet. To give you an idea how far apart they are, Perseverance is over here, and Curiosity is down here. Inside is another one of their missions as well. But Curiosity, the other rover that got there several years ago, you can see they're a very, very long distance away. I saw on the, the NASA site people that said, oh, I wonder if they can drive the two rovers so we can get a picture of each one. But this is probably like 3,000 kilometres and it takes half an hour to go from here to the door. I think they've got better things to do. Right? So... And they don't want to go to the same spot. Why do you want to go to a spot that you've spent lots and lots of money and lots and lots of time looking around here? You want to go somewhere different. If they found something really interesting here, then they probably would have. But because they haven't found anything, like, they didn't land there and go, oh my God, look at that, there's a tree. And a, and a horse just ran past. They'd probably land there, but they didn't see anything like that. So they've landed in a completely different area in what looks like a river delta where the river has um, emptied out. So you see, it's similar in design to Curiosity, but it's specifically designed, has the tools to search for signs of life. So to search for particularly fossils, microscopic fossils in rocks, in sedimentary rocks. Previous ones haven't actually had the necessary technology to do that. It also has the ability to store samples for later return and it has two microphones. Now I downloaded the, um, the sound file and even though this doesn't seem to be playing, I have to muck around with it and work out how to get it going for the next time I do it. But I couldn't actually hear anything on it because it's very, very quiet. But they put two microphones on it because they've never had a mission where they've returned sound. Never. So this sound file which was Apparently just a, a gentle breeze, so you can imagine what a breeze sounds like. But it was sounds from another planet. 
the first time ever. So they've got the two microphones there, and at the moment, again, if you go to NASA, you can Google it and you can download it and uh, listen to it. But I turned it up on my computer and I, I couldn't really hear anything much. Now, the other thing that it carries is the Ingenuity drone. Now, this is expected to be able to fly to a maximum height of about 10 metres. You don't have to go very high because it's, it's not like it's going very far and there's no building it's going to hit. It's expected to cover around about 600 metres. First flight, they're expecting around the 16th of March, so a couple of weeks' time. Once they've got everything tested, all the systems <coughs> tested, they'll be um, launching the first flight. They, they expect to be able to do five flights. It, it just has some lithium batteries in there and a solar panel to recharge it. It weighs about 1.8 kilos. Now, it's interesting because the atmosphere on Mars is much, much less than on the Earth, but the gravity is less, so it doesn't weigh as much. But because the atmosphere is so thin, the rotors have to spin incredibly fast. Now, a helicopter on Earth spins around about 400 revs a minute. This needs to spin about six times faster. And it has two contra-rotating blades. I can't do that with my hands. Um, contra-rotating blades, otherwise that would be like a, a normal Earth helicopter where it has the one out the back. Because if you don't have that, the helicopter spins and everyone gets seasick and it crashes to the ground. So it has these contra-rotating ones that go opposite ways so it doesn't <coughs> actually twist. So it has good control. And it has to spin really, really quickly. So this is an animation of what they hope it will look like. Now because of the, the um, thinner atmosphere, this would be like trying to fly a helicopter at a height of 34,000 metres. Now that's more than three times higher than a jet aircraft will fly it. You know, like back in the old days when, you know, we used to have aeroplanes that flew to places. We don't currently have it at the moment. But they would get to a cruising altitude of about 10,000 metres. This would be like trying to fly a helicopter at three times as high as what a 777 would fly at. On Earth, helicopters only fly up to about 6,000 metres and then the, Earth is, the, the atmosphere is too thin. That's why if people get stranded on Mount Everest, they can't take a helicopter up there to rescue them because the helicopter can't go that high. The air is too thin. They cannot get lift. So this is like trying to fly a helicopter at many, many times higher than what you could on Earth, which is why they have to spin so fast. They're about a metre in diameter. The rotors. As I said, it also has the sample return. The hope is it will take samples and then ultimately another mission will go to Mars, pick those samples up and return them back to the Earth. <coughs> now the samples are placed into um, small containers. They're about the size of an index finger, so they're about this big. So the idea is they find some interesting rocks or dust or whatever shove it into these little cylinders, seal the surface over, and then they leave it. Pop it out of the machine and they leave it on the surface. So once they've got several um, samples, they'll deposit a number of them in one place. It can, can hold a total of 43 samples, and it might put half a dozen or so here, and then continue on for a few months, find something else, put some more samples, dump those on the surface in Mars. Now, I, was, I tried to, to search NASA to find out why do they leave them on the surface of Mars? What are they doing that for? And then I thought about it and I thought, actually, there's, there's some very good reasons why you would do that. It means as the mission progresses, the whole thing gets lighter. So it has less mass to carry around the surface, which is better for the batteries and the motors because the machine is getting lighter. Also, what if you carry all these samples with you and you get near the end of the mission and it slides down a cliff and you can't ever get them back again? You've lost every single sample. If you move along a bit, you go, OK, we've got half a dozen good bits here, leave them here. They very accurately determine where the bits were placed. 
and then they continue on somewhere else. They might get some more samples, dump them here, and then they might go further on and it gets bogged and it cannot get out and it cannot move. And then if they were to send another rover to pick up the samples, it could also get bogged there. And so you would never get anything back. So if they leave the samples like breadcrumbs, they can then come back at some time, pick them up as they go, and if they know the rover got bogged at some particular point, they would know not to go there because chances are they'll get stuck. And so they would then come back so they could launch those, um, launch those back to, to Earth. Could also be that even if it was to get to the end of the mission and it's perfectly safe and a very easy to get to location, but it could be up on the side of a hill or somewhere like that, they have to land somewhere that's clear. They can't land on the side of a mountain. So they would land somewhere near where this initially landed. But this could be 40 or 50 kilometres away at the end of the mission. It might be right up on the top of a mountain. They can't, they can't land there, but they could drive there. But they need to land somewhere relatively close that they can get to it. So they want to make sure that it will be in an area that they can actually get to relatively close for the landing, also for where they put these samples off. And the other thing is, no one's going to move them anyway. Right? It's not like someone's going to come around and go, oh, and pick up all these samples and put them in a rubbish bin. They can come back 100 years later and they're still there. So they're not going anywhere. The wind is not going to blow them because it won't even blow a piece of paper. They'll get covered in dust. <laughs> But as long as they know where they are, they can come back and they can pick it up. So it doesn't matter whether it's in a year or 10 years, they'll know where they are, they can go and pick them up. So the idea is that at some time, and at the moment, they don't have any of this equipment. None of this has even been invented. So none of this stuff for this part of the mission even exists. What they're doing is they're collecting the samples, and China's doing the same thing, collecting the samples, They've thought we'll leave them on the surface and then one of these days we'll work out some way of getting them back. But for the meantime, we'll collect them because it could take a very long time to get these samples and if they're already on the surface, you just go along, pick them up and then bring them back. You don't really have time to hunt around and find these things. If you do them initially and just keep them there in those little capsules, then you're, all you've got to do is pick them up. You don't have to search for anything. You might have spent years looking for it all. So the idea is they will have a lander at some time that will land somewhere fairly close to the first sample, so them. Open up the, um, the top of this thing when it exists, and they'll have a little sort of a, um, a little buggy there as you like, which can go along and pick up these samples off the surface. This would then drive around on Mars, knowing where these samples are located, drive to those locations on the surface. The little robotic arm would pick them up and shove them into its, its little shopping trolley and fill up, driving around the surface, picking up each one as it goes, perhaps all 40 odd of them, or they might only get half, half of them. Depends on how the first mission with Perseverance goes. Does it roll down a cliff? and half of them are lost forever. It would then drive back to the lander and then it would transfer these samples into essentially a rocket that would be encased inside the lander somewhere. And then that rocket is to be fired up off the planet surface into orbit. So this rocket would then release this little capsule that has all these little cylinders, little index finger sized cylinders inside it with samples from all over where Perseverance went. And that little container would then remain in orbit. Then at some time they would launch another rocket to Mars, which has another mechanism that would pick this up and shove it into another little rocket. And then that little rocket would fire all the way back to the Earth, carrying these samples. So once it, it's transferred them, the capsule would be fired from this uh, orbiter in a rocket and eventually, perhaps a year or so later, it would land on the Earth somewhere and they would go and pick them up. The time frame 
at the moment for this is at least 10 years. So these samples that they'll start picking up in the next couple of months will be there for at least 10 years before they even have the sort of technology to go and pick them up. At the moment, they, they really don't know how they're going to pick them up, let alone how they're going to get them into a little thing, fire them up around Mars to go into orbit, to send another rocket to go to Mars to find this little thing that could be you know, about the size of a bucket floating around Mars, pick it up, and then fire another rocket to bring it back. They don't know how to do any of that. They don't have the technology yet. But they assume that they will. But at the moment they have the technology to put little bits of Martian rock in little metal cylinders and close it and leave them on the ground. So as for manned missions to Mars, I keep changing this. Um, SpaceX, if anyone has seen SpaceX in the last couple of days, uh, they're having a couple of problems. <laughs> they had the first one that, because the rockets they launched, these great big silver things, um, the first one launched and it was coming down to land or something and it was looking sort of okay and then it sort of tipped over and it sort of went bang, I think, didn't it? And then the one that they just did maybe yesterday or today was that it went up. The idea with the SpaceX is that they then just land. So they reuse a lot of their stuff. And this one landed and then it blew up. There was apparently some sort of a leak. So it had landed up back on the surface of the Earth. And then there was, I think, a sort of a methane leak or something like that. And that caught fire and the whole engine, the whole um, rocket exploded. So SpaceX is trying to, to get to Mars. These tests that you'll see on TV like in the last couple of days are part of their Mars mission to get someone there. At the moment, they've only successfully blasted off to about 10 kilometres in the air, landed on the ground and exploded, which is probably not a good way to finish a mission, right? You really want to land and be able to have your rockets that you can now fire and go back home. If it's exploded, then it's not really going to end very well. So at the moment, <coughs> SpaceX wants to go to Mars and NASA also wants to go to Mars. Mid-2030s, I think SpaceX's time frame was earlier than that, but they might have had to move it out a little bit with some of the explosions they've had lately. Um, they have to do a couple of new calculations. So maybe the mid-2030s. But they, they say, and they, they actually said this more than like 10 or 20 years ago, that the first, so basically in the year 2000, the first person to walk in Mars was already born. So that person, the first person that will walk on Mars is alive now. We don't know where he is, or she is. They are. I don't want to sort of preclude any sort of whatever. But um, yeah, the very first person to walk on Mars is alive somewhere in the world right now. They may only be at primary school, they might be sucking on a dummy, or they may be in secondary school, but they are alive today, the very first person. So if anyone's got any questions, Good evening, everyone. Uh, try to make sky for the month briefly brief so you can all get out there and have a copy. So, March 2021, we're already three months into this year, so things are getting a bit of a move on. Uh, highlights for uh, March, April. Uh, obviously, they're the start of April because uh, the next meeting will be there. Uh, you've got Con, uh, Comet Pons Winnipe. Uh, in northern Ophiuchus, and it's actually inbound, so it's uh, frightening from about 11 magnitude to 10 magnitude, so it should be a little bit easier to find. Uh, 20th of the 3rd, we reach the autumn equinox. Uh, basically, the uh, sun rises due east, sets due west, and our uh, nose are about 12 hours long. 26th, Venus in superior conjunction which uh, for the newer members, that means it's on exactly the other side of the sun to us. So not in a very good position to view, 
Mm. And as you can tell me, I see through the sun. Uh, make, make there, uh, in opposition. Make, make is one of the Kuiper Belt objects. It's uh, pretty small, so it would be harder than uh, Pluto to find. But for the really keen, it is in opposition, never have, have a crack. Full moon on the 29th, so uh, beach based viewing uh, won't be the best. And the moon is a perigee, which essentially means it's the closest point in its orbit to uh, Earth. So it's going to be slightly bigger, so even more bright. Heading into uh, April, we have uh, Comet Atlas, uh, 1.2 degrees uh, east of Beta Reticuli. Uh, I'll go into the comets a little bit more later in the uh, later in the presentation. And another Kuiper Belt object, uh, Halmia, is in opposition, but at 17.3 mag, you better let your carrots and have pretty good vision. As for the uh, sky, uh, looking to the, the south, basically we're heading into a, an autumn sky, so uh, you start to see. Um, I've lost it. Yeah, sorry, Orion. <laughs> I'm looking this side. Uh, Orion over here, heading towards the western horizon. Uh, mythology has it that as Orion, uh, as Scorpio rises over here, he bit uh, Orion and killed him while he was out hunting. So Orion runs away with his two dogs, then Scorpio reappears in the uh, sky. For the newer members, in two. Excellent constellations to, to pick because they, they're very easy to pick. Uh, one uh, Scorpio is a winter one, and Orion is uh, a summer one. So it gives you a couple of easier uh, constellations to find to, uh, to start a bit of a star crawl from. Uh, you've obviously got Vega Carina, uh, still fairly well up, coming a little bit higher now, uh, and that's because. The sky rotates around the South Celestial Pole. The early uh, summer, uh, Southern Cross and uh, Eta Carina have been down around here. So they're now a bit higher, as is Omega Centauri, which is probably the best globular cluster uh, to look at uh, in a telescope. Uh, just out, uh, out from uh, the Southern Cross, uh, if you sort of continue out that line there, you can see it with the naked eye, but it's just one of those fuzzy objects. Uh, looking to the north, um, essentially, oh, I've got a good fit. that one. <laughs> All right, you've got Orion uh, out here uh, on the western part of the sky at this time of night. Uh, so, if you want to have a look at the uh, Orion Nebula. Uh, your last opportunity is coming up and you should prepare to get up early in the morning. And uh, that's, uh, so that's the sky. These here are uh, open clusters and generally you can see most of them with the naked eye. Uh, but put a telescope on them, it kind of resolves into what they are. The planets, Mercury uh, has moved through inferior conjunction, which means it's moved between the Earth and the Sun. We don't always get a transit because it's not always exactly on the ecliptic plane relative to Earth. Um, it reached its maximum, um, oh sorry, yeah, it's gone through its inferior because it's now in the morning sky. So if you want to see Mercury, you need to get up in the morning. And on the 6th or the 3rd, it reached its maximum elongation, which basically means it's greater greatest angle off from the sun, the furthest it gets from the sun, and so the best time to view it. Uh, it's fairly speedy, so it's uh, already heading towards its superior conjunction on the other side there. But in the years it won't be long, it'll be back in the uh, evening sky. Uh, Venus, obviously too close to the sun. 26th to the 3rd, it uh, goes through superior conjunction, so it's behind the sun, I promise. So, uh, so I hope you're uh, looking at seeing Venus at the moment. Earth, as I said, approaches its autumnal, autumnal equinox on the 20th of the 3rd. Then the day's starting to get shorter. Uh, Mars is beginning the month uh, near to the Pleiades, which is an open star cluster in Taurus, uh, over on the western horizon. Uh, it can be confused with Aldebaran, which is a uh, 
about the same size or same magnitude as Mars at the moment, and they're both red. So make sure you're looking at Mars and not Aldebaran. Jupiter uh, is now becoming a reasonable uh, morning object as well through uh, conjunction with the sun. And so if you uh, want to get up early morning, you can now see, uh, see Jupiter. Mercury was also fairly close uh, earlier in the month, uh, but it won't stay there for long. Uh, Saturn uh, is still fairly close to Jupiter, uh, also a morning object, but two magnitudes duller than what uh, Jupiter is. Uh, smaller and twice as far. Uh, Uranus <coughs> still in uh, Aries, low on the western horizon, and uh, it's probably getting lost in twilight now. So it's not a great time to, to view Uranus. And Neptune is in conjunction on the 11th. So uh, I guess most of the planets are all pretty much in the same part of the sky, which is not favourable for viewing this, uh, this particular time. The appearance of the planets, if you uh, are keen enough to get up and see them, I don't know why they put Venus, you've got no hope of seeing it at the moment. So, uh, but if you could, it would be as small as it gets and full face on to us. Uh, Mars, well, you can say it's sort of disappearing over the horizon, but in actual fact, uh, as you saw from Trevor's uh, presentation, we actually speed past Mars and then keep going. And, and so Mars doesn't actually get further from us, we get further from Mars. Uh, Saturn is it, still showing uh, side on with its ring, so uh, still fairly uh, pretty to have a look at. As I said, you like to get up in the morning to see it. Jupiter are always impressive with its moons, and uh, Uranus and Neptune probably wouldn't bother with them at the moment, given their either in conjunction or just through conjunction. Other stuff, the comets, uh, N1 Atlas is actually very close to the South Celestial Pole. So uh, you can pick that out by uh, either using the Southern Cross and the uh, pointers to pick the approximate area. I know one member did have a look at it and it came up with a declination, which is angle of around about 89 degrees, which is almost uh, straight at the South Pole. Uh, the one beauty of that is it uh, will make it a little bit easier to find and uh, towards the end of the month it will be passing between the Magellanic Clouds. Uh, they're the uh, large and small Magellanic Clouds, which uh, small one's not as obvious as the large one, but uh, down a little bit closer to the uh, uh, Milky Way. So, uh, if you're looking for it, it's 11.5 magnitude, it is heading out of the solar system. Uh, sorry, heading out of the inner solar system. The other one, Pons Winky, uh, is visible in northern Hercules, southern Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus is uh, over near Scorpio. That's uh, it's between Scorpio <coughs> and Sagittarius, or the one I saw. Uh, from about midnight to dawn. Uh, nothing's really favourable for us at the moment unless you're a bit of an early bird. Uh, it is brightening from 11th to 10th magnitude, so we can hope as it goes, it actually starts to appear in the old evening sky. Meteor showers, you have the Gamma Normans, uh, active from 25th of the 2nd to the 28th of the 3rd. They're not overly spectacular, but around about the 14th of the 3rd, the 3rd is their maximum of about 6 per hour, and their best also, we did before dawn. Okay. The minor planets, by minor planets we mean uh, asteroids, uh, that sort of stuff. The one worth noting there is, uh, is Vesta. I think it's about the second largest in the uh, asteroid belt after Ceres. And it's at magnitude 5.8, so it, uh, it should be about the same as Uranus uh, in terms of looking at whether you can pick it. Uh, against the starry background, that's another matter. The other two, fairly uh, low magnitudes, uh, that sort of stuff, Aspasia and Sylvia. So two of them are in Leo, one is in the crater. And Pluto, still in Sagittarius, it's not exactly the fastest object. Uh, it did move past junction in uh, January, so it too is a morning object. So 
you really had a really big colour scope. You can get out there, you'd be able to see everything in the, in the one scope uh, at the moment. So, those who watched the one last month would have saw the end of the solar system tour, so start to give it a little bit of a chat about practical astronomy. And I've decided to pick on the lunar month, or should I say lunar months. Essentially, a lunar month is a time between two syzygies of the same type. A syzygy is new moon to new moon, uh, aphelion to aphelion, etc. I'll go through all of that as we go. Uh, move on. The first one's a sidereal month. It's a period of the moon's orbit with respect to the celestial sphere. What's the celestial sphere? Well, if you imagine the sky as a big ball and someone's drawn all these little stars on it, the stars stay in a pretty well relative or same spot. And what happens is as the moon goes around the Earth, it moves through a variety of constellations. Pretty much uh, because it's close to the uh, ecliptic, it's pretty well moves through the zodiac uh, constellations. So at the moment, if you look at your app or you go out there and look and you can identify it, you'll see the moon is in, uh, is in Pisces. So I've got a little bit of homework for everyone if you're interested. Um, as it orbits the Earth, as I said, it moves through these different constellations, eventually completing its orbit, returning to the constellation it started in. So at the moment it's in Pisces, in about a lunar month's time it should be back in Pisces, shouldn't it? So that's the homework. Over the next uh, month or so, if you can be bothered, just go out, have a look where the moon is and take note of the date and what constellation it's in. And then when it's back in Pisces, count the number of days and see if it comes to 27.321661 days. <laughs> if that's too hard, you can 27 days, 7 hours, 43 minutes, 11.6 seconds. Right, I'll go easy on you if you can't get the point six seconds right, all right? <laughs> now that's a sidereal month. So essentially that basically is, uh, is just from uh, constellation to constellation. The next one is the one we're probably more familiar with, and that's known as the synodic month. And uh, that's a period of the moon's orbit with respect to a piece of string joining the sun and the earth. Okay, that's essentially new moon to new moon. Or if you want to go the other way, full moon to full moon. Okay. So if you think, well, okay, it's just going to whiz around there and it's going to be between us and the, uh, us and the sun at some stage, so it's going to be about the same as a sidereal uh, month. It's not actually. It actually hits, it starts off, you know, let's say uh, the sun's here in front of me, I hits the earth and I've got this little moon going around me. And as it goes around me, it completes an orbit from new moon to new moon. The problem is, my head Earth has moved over here in its orbit. And so the moon has got to go a little bit further to actually become another new, new moon. And the long term average, which is due to variable Earth's orbit speed, that's because the Earth, uh, I'm sorry, the lunar orbit is an eclipse, I'm sorry, an ellipse and uh, it, it speeds up a parts of its orbit and it slows down in other parts of its orbit. So we're on average 29.530587981 days, which translates to 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, 2.8016 seconds. I really don't know who worked that out. <laughs> All right. I'm guessing they used an atomic clock and they set it on auto. So that's the synodic month. So that's the one we're more interested in as astronomers because we want to go out there and observe deep sky objects with no moon, don't we? We prefer the new moon uh, phases or the early uh, pre-new moon and post-new moon. Not all that happy going out there when there's a full moon. The next one is the anomalistic month. As I said, the moon's orbit is an ellipse. And it has two things known as aspens. Aspens. And that is essentially apogee and perigee. Aspens are the points in an orbit that is closest to the object that's orbiting. 
and the furthest from the orbit. So if you imagine a line between those two, um, essentially, it says the moon moves through apogee, back around to apogee again. And uh, or it could be perigee to perigee. Now, the real problem with that one is the orbit actually processes in the direction of the, uh, the lunar or the moon orbits. Now that essentially means that it, it's not a constant uh, orbit. The orbit actually does that. And it rotates through 360 degrees every 8.85 years. Good figure to remember, it's in the text, okay? <laughs> Okay, that uh, in the time it takes for the moon to go from apogee to apogee is, uh, is known as its anomalistic month, and that is 27.554 blah 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 days, or 27 days, 13 hours, 18 minutes. So a little bit more than the sidereal, but not as much as the uh, synodic. And uh, the last one is the draconic month. And the, basically, the moon's orbit is inclined to the ecliptic plane by 5.14 degrees. So it doesn't go around on the ecliptic. If it did, we'd get a total eclipse every month. And we get a lunar eclipse every month. But because of that inclination to the orbit, it either spends half of its orbit in the northern celestial sphere and the other half of its orbit in the southern celestial sphere. Which means that there are two points uh, in its orbit where it crosses the ecliptic plane. And these are known as nodes, the ascending node and the descending node. And the draconic month is the length of time between two, passes through two similar nodes. So you base it on the descending node, it's a time taken to go from descending node all the way around to descending node, or ascending node to ascending node. And uh, it also processes, you knew it was going to do that, didn't you? <laughs> and uh, it actually processes at the rate that it uh, goes through 360 degrees every 18.6 years. But this is the main reason why we don't get a total eclipse every month. Most of the time, uh, it's a bubble below the ecliptic. So astronomers work out when it's going to be on the ecliptic. I'm oh, sorry, yeah. Well, going through a, a ascending or descending node when it's a new moon. That's when you get a total eclipse. And going through the ascending or descending node when it's effectively in opposition is when you'll get a lunar eclipse. That's why I those. And because it processes, and it processes the opposite direction to the anomalistic month, it actually goes towards the moon, and so it's a shorter period of time, but 27 days, 5 hours, 5 minutes. So if someone says, what's a lunar month? <laughs> you can ask them, which one are you talking about? Or you can just say about 28 days. And tonight's information provided by Astronomy 2021, you haven't already got a copy, you see Simon at the end of the night, more than happy to sell you at, uh, at a very reasonable price and it has a lot of good information in it. Any questions? Thank you. Bye for Thanks, Mark. Okay, well with that we'll uh, break uh, for a tea break um, and uh, for those who wish to view the videos afterwards we'll start them at uh, 10 to 10 on the clock, so just a 10 minute tea break. Those who wish to stay outside and chat, that's fine. Um, if you have to leave, that's fine. Um, feel free to come in and out of the videos as you wish. Don't, uh, don't feel that, uh, that you, once you're in, you're in for the whole length of time, just uh, whatever suits. Uh, I'm not sure if the observatory is open uh, at all, but if anyone's interested in observing, there'll be someone, I think, to, uh, to open up and show you through uh, the telescopes. Now, if you haven't uh, QR coded yet, please make sure that you do. Uh, if you need any help doing that, one of our members will gladly uh, help you to uh, uh, log yourself in. Okay.
Take any circle, measure its circumference and its diameter. The ratio of these two numbers is a mathematical constant we call pi. While this definition is simple, pi has been studied for thousands of years, and a history of our understanding not just of the value of pi, but also what it means, forms a history of all of mathematics. It takes us from the Middle East, to Europe, to China, to India, and even America. It's a history which involves revolutions, murder, and the infinite. Maths is as old as civilization. Older even. There's evidence of counting going back 30,000 years. And two of the very earliest civilizations, the ancient Egyptians and Babylonians, both investigated pi around 4,000 years ago. The Babylonians estimated pi to be 3 and 1 eighth, or 3.125. Now that's the first of a few estimates you're going to hear in this video, so for reference, remember that the first few digits of pi are 3.1415926. There are more. That means that the Babylonian estimate of pi is accurate to 1% of its true value, which is kind of astonishing when you remember that this is a time in human history when iron was first being used and the last mammoths went extinct. The ancient Egyptians, on the other hand, estimated pi slightly less accurately as 3.16. But how do you even estimate the value of pi? You have to kind of by definition measure a curved surface, which is super tricky to do accurately. Well, one way of doing it is to cheat and actually use a square. Compare a square and a circle. Well, a square is a little bit like a circle, but not as much like a circle as a pentagon, which has one more side than a square. And a pentagon doesn't look quite as much like a circle as a hexagon, which has one more side again. And a hexagon doesn't look quite as much like a circle as a heptagon, and so on. You can think of a circle as a regular polygon, just one with an extremely large number of sides. So many sides, in fact, that each individual one is infinitesimally small, meaning that the circle looks round. This was exactly the thinking that legendary ancient Greek mathematician Archimedes used when estimating pi around 220 BC. In fact, it was probably the very last thing he ever did. To approximate pi, he reasoned, why not measure the perimeter of a square, adding up the lengths of all of its edges, and then dividing that number by the square's diameter? But what is the diameter of a square? Is it the length of its diagonal, or the length of one of its edges? Why not both, said Archimedes. Draw one square with its corners just touching the perimeter of a circle, and another square with its faces just touching the perimeter of that same circle. Add up the lengths of the sides of each square, divide by their effective diameters, and you have two estimates for the value of pi, the true value of which lies somewhere between those two numbers. But here's the really clever part. Because the difference between those two values is pretty big if you're using squares, because a square isn't much like a circle. But replace those squares with pentagons, and you shrink the difference between those two numbers, meaning that there's a smaller range of values that pi could be. Your estimation just got more accurate. And if you replace those pentagons with hexagons, you'll get an even more accurate estimate. Keep increasing the number of faces on the shape that you're drawing inside and outside the circle, and your estimate will get more and more accurate. As long as you have the time and patience to draw said shapes. There is a reason why this thing was called the method of exhaustion. Archimedes got up to a 96-sided shape, which incidentally is called an Aenea Contica hexagon. I really hope I said that right. Giving an estimate of pi between 3.1408 and 3.1429, so accurate to two decimal places. As I mentioned earlier, this was likely his final contribution to science, because in 212 BC he was killed by Roman soldiers who invaded his hometown of Syracuse. He was apparently performing this calculation at the time. Allegedly his final words were, don't disturb my circles. European progress in the study of pi died with Archimedes for well over a thousand years. Fortunately, however, there was plenty of the world which was not in Europe, and mathematicians here were also interested in pi. In particular, three mathematical superpowers of the first millennium AD were China, India, and Persia. Ideas from these three nations were soon to change the world. 
First off, Chinese mathematicians used a method of exhaustion similar to Archimedes, but instead of considering the perimeters of shapes, they considered their areas. And this dude, no, I'm not going to try and pronounce his name, because I'll only get it wrong, used a polygon with 3072 sides to obtain pi to five decimal places. 200 years later, a father and son team used a polygon with over 12,000 sides to extend that record to six decimal places. And that was a world record which stood for 800 years. The problem was, it was just difficult to do these calculations. They weren't especially hard to understand. It was just awkward to write down what you were doing, to physically do the calculation. And this was something that would only be resolved by the introduction of two world-changing ideas from India and Persia. Say that you want to do a calculation. You know that you and your friends together weigh 125 kilos. And you also know that you weigh 70 kilos. The question is, how much does your friend weigh? Mathematically, we'd write this as x plus 70 equals 125, where x is your friend's weight in kilos. Subtract 70 from both sides and you get the answer, 55 kilos. Now, in that simple example, I just used two ideas which were revolutionary to the classical world. Firstly, I wrote large numbers like 125 and 70 using a simple notation. We take it for granted these days, but the ability to write any number using just 10 symbols and a place value notation where the position of a symbol in a number determines its size massively simplifies arithmetic. To see what I mean, try and do that calculation only using Roman numerals. Our modern decimal notation was first developed in India sometime before 400 AD, and then rapidly spread to Persia, where the second key idea came from. The second key idea was representing your friend's weight using some symbol, x, and then manipulating both sides of the equation. This, of course, is algebra. Originally developed by Babylonian and ancient Greek mathematicians, but truly established by Persian mathematician and all-round very influential dude, Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi. Using decimal notation and algebra allowed for much easier calculations across all of maths, and mathematicians working on calculating pi used it to turbocharge their work. After the Renaissance and a renewed interest in mathematics, along with, crucially, new tools from the East, Europe was back in the game, and in 1630, the most accurate estimate of pi using the polygon method was achieved by Austrian astronomer Christian Greinberger, who used a shape with 10 to the 40 sides, yes, really, to calculate pi to 38 decimal places. And then, because mathematicians are sensible people with lives to lead, they decided that was accurate enough and they'd leave it there. Oh wait. The adoption of algebra by European mathematicians triggered a whole new way of looking at the world, a change in thinking generally grouped under the title the Scientific Revolution, which itself went on to inspire the Age of Enlightenment, with thinkers like René Descartes and John Locke. Amongst other ideas, the Enlightenment movement emphasised the value of reason over tradition, and new mathematical ideas were held up as paragons of this. They were pure reason. The change in how 17th century European mathematicians calculated pi is arguably a perfect example of the shift from following what the ancients did to new, rational, theoretical approaches. Because while the ancients, like Archimedes, may have measured the perimeters of shapes increasingly similar to circles, now European mathematicians were using a method based entirely on reason. A method based on infinite series. An infinite series is just an expression made up of things added together, one after the other, after the other, after the other, and so on, until forever. If those contributions keep getting smaller as you go on, then the series converges to a particular value. Sometimes you can work out what that value will be using logical arguments, but sometimes you just have to keep calculating term after term after term until you reach an accuracy that you're happy with. The method of using infinite series to calculate pi was first used not in Europe, but again in India. You could kind of argue that what Archimedes did was an infinite series, but the first person to write a mathematical function as an infinite series was Indian mathematician Madhava of Sangamagrama in the 14th century. 
He wrote down expressions for the sine, cosine, and tangent of an angle, as well as the inverse tangent. Quick refresher. If you write the expression y equals tan of x, the expansion for the tangent would tell you what y equals if you already know what x is, while the expansion of the inverse tangent would tell you what x is if you already know what y is. By its definition, the function tan of x precisely equals 1 when x equals 1 quarter pi. That means that if you have an expression for the inverse tangent, then if you plug 1 into that expression and keep calculating terms, you'll end up with an increasingly accurate estimate of 1 quarter pi. Madhava did this and calculated pi to 11 digits, but then his method seems to have been forgotten, only to be apparently independently rediscovered in 17th century Europe by Scott James Gregory and German Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. And at this point, everything kicked off. The new decimal notation and algebraic technique allowed for record calculations of pi. In 1699, it was calculated to 71 digits by Abraham Sharp, who was beaten in 1706 when John Matchin reached 100 digits, who was in turn beaten by Thomas Fontet de Lagny, I hope that's how you say his name, in 1719 with 112 digits. It wasn't just the case that each of those mathematicians had more spare time than the previous one, they were competing with each other using different infinite series, which converged on pi faster. Instead of just using the inverse tangent infinite series, they might use a combination of different inverse tangent values, or something completely different. The competition then became less about which mathematician had done the most calculations, and instead which mathematician had the fastest converging infinite series. Development of increasingly efficient infinite series continued well into the 20th century, with the technique kind of coming full circle, as the current infinite series of choice was developed by Indian prodigy mathematician Srinivasa Ramunujan. Of course, by the 20th century, mechanical computers had been invented, making it much easier to calculate pi. You basically just used one until you got bored. In 1949, Americans D. F. Ferguson and John Wrench calculated pi to 1,120 digits. But they were bringing a knife to a gunfight, because that very same year, the first calculation of pi by an electronic computer was done, nearly doubling their record with 2,037 digits. From here, the history of pi is basically a list of increasingly powerful computers running for a long time and spitting out increasingly absurd numbers of digits. At the time of recording, the world record for digits of pi calculated is held by Peter Trub, with a shade under 22 and a half trillion digits calculated. The question of course is, if we know that pi is going to keep going on forever, it's a transcendental number, why should anybody bother calculating any more digits? Well, for one thing, calculating pi is actually a really good way of making sure that your brand new shiny computer is working properly. Calculating pi uses up a lot of mental brain power for the computer, you have an answer that you can check yours against, and also if you keep going just a little bit longer than the previous person, you can have a casual world record. Secondly, pi is actually a really good random number generator. If you look at the first 200 billion digits of pi, you will find the number zero occurs almost precisely 20 billion times. And the same goes for the other digits, one through nine. That means that if you were to pick a random digit in those 200 billion, there's an almost exactly 10% chance of it being one, and an almost exactly 10% chance of it being two, and so on. This makes calculating pi to a large number of digits very valuable to people that want to generate random numbers. People working in cryptography, for example. But lastly, and arguably most importantly, People keep calculating more digits of pi for the same reason why people memorise tens of thousands of digits of pi, and the same reason why people climb mountains and swim oceans and invent the double luge. Because they can. Humans are weird. We like to understand the world around us, and as our civilization has developed, we've built increasingly complex tools to help us understand the world. It wasn't essential for our survival that we did that. We just did it because of the way we're wired. Because we could. 
Pi is a thread that's gone through all of human history because it's a microcosm of how we interact with the natural world, from the ancients to present day, through revolutions in thought and across the world. As long as there are people, there's always going to be somebody who just wonders, what's the next digit? Long may that continue. Any chance you're feeling a bit itchy? Well, it's likely that you're suffering from something called the social itch. Research suggests that itching really is quite contagious, with one study finding that volunteers were twice as likely to scratch themselves when viewing footage of other people scratching than when viewing people doing nothing. When researchers chucked people in a brain scanner, they found that watching others scratch produce similar brain activity to when people physically scratch themselves, suggesting that the social itch is just as real as the itch that you scratch when you're itching on your own. Whilst the standard itch may have evolved to alert us to insects or to draw attention to certain areas of the skin, the evolutionary benefit of the social itch is less clear. But if we look to primates, who also exhibit social itching, we can begin to get an idea of why this behavioural phenomenon might exist. It's thought that in close-knit social communities, contagious itching might help to prevent the spread of parasitic diseases from one individual to another by sensitising the skin of individuals in the group so that they become more aware of potential parasites on their own skin. In order to achieve this response, Social itching is likely to involve a number of areas within the brain, from visual to behavioural activation areas. Studies that have dug a little deeper have specifically linked special types of cells in the brain called mirror neurons to social itching. Mirror neurons are active when we perform an action, but also when we observe the same action being performed by another individual. It is possible that in the human brain, mirror neurons are involved in activating other areas of the brain to generate the social itch response. So, if you want to have a bit of fun, go into a crowded room and have a good old scratch and watch the itch spread around the room. Hello, and welcome to my hygiene corner here on the ISS. This is the place where I wash, brush my teeth, or after workouts, take a shower ISS style. The heart of the um, hygiene corner is the toiletry pouch, Comfort 1M. It's Russian made, and uh, most crew members ask to have one sent up for them. Uh, it's really useful to um, deploy our hygiene items and hygiene items come come up in a ziplock like this one this contains supplies that need to last for six months and they don't look much different from what uh, your hygiene items look in your bathroom probably uh, you can see a toothbrush here toothpaste tube deodorant and as far as towels are concerned we cannot wash stuff up here so um, we get a supply of towels uh, every week. We get a towel like this one and a smaller washcloth. I usually take my new ones out on Sundays, so it's not quite time yet. I put those back and um, for today I will use the ones that I have already deployed for the week. Every second day we can also take out a new um, let's say camping towel. It's one of those uh, light towels. It comes in a foil like this, it's dry, and then we can add water, wet it, and it, it's really nice to, to clean your skin. In terms of uh, brushing your teeth, it's actually um, very similar to what you would do on Earth. As I said, 
uh, toothbrush and toothpaste look just the same and you brush your teeth just the same. Uh, the only difference, of course, is that we don't have a sink to spit in when we're done. Um, all that extra toothpaste. So some uh, astronauts uh, just swallow it. Um, it's quick and, and easy. Um, I personally don't like to do that, so I actually spit it in a towel. Um, it's not the most elegant thing, but uh, you have to do what you have to do. As far as soap is concerned, it comes up uh, in, in pouches like this one. You need to add water, and then you get a nice uh, liquid soap pouch which needs to last for about two weeks. And it's a no rinse type of soap. It doesn't make a lot of foam and it doesn't really need to be rinsed. And of course, we do not have any running water up here. So we also need to fill up uh, water pouches. Uh, we can connect pouches like this one to the water dispenser, which is in the nearby module in the US lab. And uh, I personally like to, to fill it up with warm water when it's time to wash, but uh, you can also fill it up with ambient temperature water. So I'll, I'll go ahead and do this right now, and I'll see you in a minute. Here I am, and I got my water. So first of all, I'd like to show you um, how water behaves in weightlessness, which is kind of uh, interesting. Uh, of course, it doesn't fall down um, like it does on Earth, and it kind of tends to stick to your skin because of surface tension. I don't know if you can see it. See, it doesn't really want to move away from your hand. Just because of that surface tension effect. Now, of course, I put a lot of water on my hand just to show you. You wouldn't, you wouldn't use all that water to wash um, just because it's, it's a little bit difficult to control. So I'm actually gonna dry it off. But if you have some time, um, to be, you know, to, to take your time and be careful, you can, you can do that, I think. Um, I do it sometimes. I, I really put some water on my skin, like that. You know, just a little bit. And, um, and then I add some soap. Like that. And you can carefully go ahead and rub it. And it actually really gives you a nice feeling of, uh, of cleanliness. And then as I said, I like to keep my actual towels here dry so you can use them to, to dry off. Now, of course, you, you don't always have the time to take it slowly and be so careful. So if you are a little bit more in a rush, let's say it's a, it's, a, it's a work day and you had your workout and then you have to rush off and do something else, then you will simply, um, you know, just squirt the water into your camping towel and add some soap and that's a lot easier to control because you can just rub your skin like that. And uh, it, I don't find it as pleasant, but uh, it's certainly a lot quicker and, and, easier, to, and easier to control. Now, all the, the water that you use eventually ends up in the towels that you use to dry. And we leave uh, those towels close to a ventilation grid, like in this case you can see a ventilation grid right here, so that they can dry off. And all the water then is uh, recuperated. Um, it evaporates in the air and then in the um, air conditioning system it condensates again and it goes into our uh, uh, water recuperation bus and it actually gets turned into potable water again. So we don't absolutely lose any of the water that we use to wash. Cutting your fingernails is not the easiest thing in, uh, in weightlessness. So of course, you, um, you don't want to lose any pieces of nails uh, around the cabin. So um, the best thing is actually to do it really close to a um, return grid of the ventilation system so that uh, all the pieces of nails that you cut off um, get immediately attracted, um, sucked towards the grid, um, kind of like this. There you go. And then when you're done, of course, you want to have uh, a vacuum cleaner handy so that you can uh, clean after yourself. And to um, wash your hair, um, we have a, 
a special no rinse shampoo uh, that requires uh, um, theoretically no rinsing but at least very little rinsing so we just squirt uh, water into our hair uh, we add some shampoo uh, we massage it just like we would on earth and then we kind of dry the excess water and shampoo off with uh, with a towel and uh, and off we go So what is the electromagnetic spectrum? Most simply, it is light and describes the total range of light that exists. In many communities, the spectrum is often referred to as energy or radiation and is described in terms of energy, wavelength, or frequency. Whether you refer to the EM spectrum as light, energy, or radiation, each is correct, and throughout this video, we refer to each interchangeably. There are many types of light besides what we can see such as infrared and gamma rays. The primary source of light is emitted or radiated from the sun and stars. However, we can produce radiation ourselves, such as when we go to the doctor and have an x-ray taken, or even by turning on a light bulb. Light travels at a constant rate, roughly 300 millimeters per second when in a vacuum, or the speed of light. Light is made up of two parts, electric fields and magnetic fields, thus the electromagnetic spectrum. All objects above zero degrees Kelvin emit radiation. However, the amount of radiation emitted is a function of both temperature and wavelength. Our sun emits radiation across the whole EM spectrum. Most of the light given off by the sun we cannot see. However, we use sensors on satellites which measure and record the various light emissions from the sun or other objects such as the heat from a jet engine. Scientists then will typically add a color code to the image to depict the various temperature ranges represented. Typically, red will represent the higher temperatures and blue the lower temperatures. Now, to better understand the EM spectrum, let's break it down in terms of wavelength and frequency. What is wavelength and frequency? Let's look at the ocean to better illustrate these terms. Disturbances on the surface and under the water create swells or waves. The distance from the top of one wave to the top of the next is called wavelength. Then the rate at which waves pass the same point in the given time is called frequency. Now, let's relate frequency and wavelength back to the EM spectrum. The EM spectrum is made up of a bunch of waves, all traveling at the speed of light but some parts of the waves are more closely spaced and other parts are spaced further apart. So, just like the ocean example, the further the wave spacing or larger the wavelength, the smaller the frequency. The more closely the spacing of the waves are smaller the wavelength, the larger the frequency. We will go in more detail on frequency and wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum laws educational aid. But for now, we just need to know that frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional. So the larger the wave's wavelength, the smaller its frequency. The larger the wave's frequency, the smaller its wavelength. These differences in frequency and wavelength break up the EM spectrum into portions or subregions. The portions that divide the EM spectrum are as follows. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. Now, let's talk about each of these subranges in terms of wavelength and frequency and their general space application. Radio waves have the largest wavelength ranging from 10 kilometers to 10 centimeters. That's the size of a large building to a baseball. It has frequencies ranging from 3 kilohertz to 300 megahertz. Radio waves are widely used to transmit information across distances in radio communication systems, such as radio broadcasting, television, two-way radios, mobile phones, communication satellites, and wireless networking. Microwave wavelengths range from 10 centimeters to one millimeter, the size of a baseball, 
to head up a pen with frequencies from 300 megahertz to 300 gigahertz. Microwaves are the main wavelengths used in radar, but also are used for satellite communications and wireless networking technologies such as Wi-Fi, although at these power levels they are unable to cause thermal heating. Infrared wavelengths range from 1 millimeter to 1 micron, so about the size of a period on a piece of paper, to cells. Its frequency range from 300 gigahertz to 300 tetrahertz. Infrared waves are used to detect thermal radiation. Because of the size of the infrared wavelength, they can pass through clouds, gas, and dust. This makes infrared useful for meteorology, geology, and astronomy. Visible light wavelengths range from about half micron, about the size of cells, and has a frequency of 300 tetrahertz. Visible light is a part of the EM spectrum the human eye is the most sensitive to. This wavelength is typically used for remote sensing, agricultural, and astronomy. Ultraviolet wavelengths are about 10 nanometers, so about the size of a virus. And from this point on, the size of the frequency starts getting so large, it is simplest to only refer to wavelengths. Since the Earth's atmosphere absorbs much of the high energy UV radiation, Scientists and astronomers use this information gathered by sensors on satellites orbiting the Earth to observe UV radiation coming from the Sun and other celestial bodies. X-ray wavelengths are about 0.1 nanometers, about the size of DNA. Scientists and astronomers use X-ray sensors on satellites to collect information concerning the Sun. As stated earlier, the Sun produces light in all the subregions but the sun's corona radiates primarily in the X-ray subregion. This information allows tracking of sunspots and allows astronomers to determine solar flux of the sun. Gamma ray wavelengths are about 10 picometers, about the size of an atom. Gamma rays have the smallest wavelength and the most energy of any subregion in the EM spectrum. They are produced by the hottest and most energetic objects in the universe, such as neutron stars and pulsars, supernova explosions, and regions around black holes. Scientists also use gamma rays to determine elements on other planets. However, effectively using these subregions of the electromagnetic spectrum does have its limitations. One of these limitations is atmospheric absorption. All materials do one of three things to electromagnetic energy. Depending upon the wavelength of the energy, it either absorbs the energy, reflects the energy, or the energy passes through the material. Therefore, atmospheric absorption is the Earth's atmosphere absorbing the radiation being emitted. In some cases, this is a very good thing. Many of the harmful energies emitted by the sun is absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, thereby protecting us here on Earth. But using the full electromagnetic spectrum for space applications, the Earth's atmosphere can become problematic. The different layers of the Earth's atmosphere clouds, and rain can affect or absorb some portions of the EM spectrum. This picture provided by NASA shows the various subregions of the EM spectrum and the absorption of the spectrum being emitted. In the middle of this picture details the absorption of the EM spectrum. The gray areas show the areas the spectrum is absorbed or partially absorbed. The areas without the gray are our transmission windows. So. Now we have the EM spectrum broken down to subregions and by frequency and wavelength. But why is this important? All objects that are above zero degrees Kelvin emit energy. When EM radiation strikes an object, energy is either transmitted, it goes through the object, is reflected by the object, bounces off, or is absorbed, adds additional energy to the object. Knowing the frequency of the emitted EM spectrum of an object allows us to determine the type of sensor required to image the object. Knowing the wavelength allows us to know through what medium or mediums the energy will transmit through or be absorbed. In the EM Payload Educational Aid, we will discuss this frequency and wavelength relationship in more detail. But for now, this educational aid gives us a basic understanding of the EM spectrum. This table gives a good summary of the size, wavelength, frequencies, and space application of the EM spectrum and its subregions. 
That is it for the basics of the electromagnetic spectrum. I am Jeremy Brown with the National Security Space Institute. I hope you enjoyed this educational aid. One uh, final thing before uh, we close. Uh, this, um, uh, th this will uh, show uh, an animation from uh, NASA of all the uh, moon phases for all of 2021. And I have to say it's quite hypnotic when you watch it, so don't uh, nod off to sleep. Um, keep your eye on the appearance of the moon because it shows how the moon changes in size as well. So it's not just the phase, so in other words, whether you see a crescent, um, crescent moon or a full moon of that, but it's also the size uh, of the moon on the diagram. You'll, you'll actually see that very, very clearly. And it also shows horizontally how far the moon is away from the Earth. And it moves uh, backwards and forwards at about 30 Earth diameters away. So you'll um, uh, get to see that. Thank you.